Welcome, uh, everyone. Um, this is the meeting of the Los Alamos Study Group, and we are very happy that you're here. Um, we will try to answer questions that you have to the best of our ability. There are people here uh, in the audience who know a great deal about what's going on, and um, so this, some of this will be boring for them, but they will have insights later when it comes to questions and paths forward and so forth, as well as the rest of you. Um, so we know everyone's very busy, and so thank you, thank you again. It's been hard to get the word out about what is the largest construction project in the history of New Mexico. And it is a little complicated, and it's not all put in one place, so, uh, and it treads on toes to talk about it, and it can, uh, if done wrong, I suppose it could jeopardize a journalist's career. So people are shocked. Um, elected officials were invited uh, here tonight uh, from uh, all the city councilors and county commissioners, the governor, uh, the congressional delegation, uh, well, uh, not uh, Melanie or Yvette, but um, their staffs, we, you know, there was a chance staff might come and we did get um, apology notes, uh, Trish did, from several. So, I, uh, my name is Greg Mello, I forgot to say that. I'm the executive director of the Los Alamos Study Group. Trish Williams Mello, my wife, is our operations manager. We have uh, two board members here, Lydia Clark uh, at the camera, and Shiku May Shinaberry there. And other people uh, we have known and worked with on these issues and other issues for decades, uh, it's kind of scattered around. This is the general idea of the agenda tonight. Um, we want to talk uh, kind of in a summary fashion at the beginning, then uh, talk about Los Alamos, what's going on right here, with lots of time to discuss and have questions and answers. Our guest speaker uh, from South Carolina has canceled, um, although we did speak with him today, and uh, he assures me that the, he, yeah, uh, we have, we're on the same page, we just got a briefing, what we, I got a briefing in August, and that's the most recent one, so we're up to speed, but I'm sorry if he's not here, we were going to zoom him in. We think it's important to overcome an artificial division between issues, uh, so we'll try to talk about that a little bit, and then we want to talk about next steps. And uh, and we don't have all the answers here, so um, we are eager for your input. We're going to talk, uh, refer to pits um, in this talk. Uh, this is a nuclear warhead uh, in schematic form, and the only thing we need to worry about tonight is uh, this little part um, in the center of that yellow egg. Um, that is a nested construction with plutonium alloy shells in, in the core. That is the thistle core of an atomic bomb. That little egg-shaped thing at the top there is a little atomic bomb. And the United States does not at present have a way to make those plutonium uh, hemispheres or ellipsoids. Um, we have not had one since the closure of the Rocky Flats plant in 1989. So um, it's not like we don't have a lot of pits, but they are of different kinds and the powers that be are very nervous uh, that they cannot make new kinds and eventually the old ones will change and uh, become uh, more brittle um, and their properties will change. But eventually is not yet. Eventually will be some decades from now. Huh. 
the warheads go on missiles. And this is an old picture of warheads on an, uh, in a kind of mock-up on the MX missile, which you may recall from the Reagan administration, which was canceled. Um, but uh, the idea of putting multiple warheads on a single missile is very much around. And there was just recently a test launch of a Minuteman III missile with three warheads on it. If the United States did not seek to retain the capability to have multiple warheads on one missile, then we wouldn't have any pit prediction. So that's um, it's sort of important. This warhead, the W87, there are enough of those to put on all the land-based missiles we have, and at the rate of one per missile. But if any were, uh, but that's not, there's not enough to put three per missile. Um, at present, we can put uh, three warheads on about 200 missiles. They're a different warhead. That warhead is retiring. So the capability of, of doubling the overall, putting more warheads on doubles the number of warheads we have to throw at, say, Russia. That is a schematic of the new <coughs> missile, which is being designed at present, called the ground-based strategic deterrent. It will cost in the neighborhood of a hundred billion dollars, and we would like to start deploying this missile in 2030. The life cycle cost is expected to be about a quarter trillion um, over the whole life cycle of the missile. And uh, there is a new warhead that is being designed, the W87-1, to go on this, and it needs new bits uh, in general. Um, they could recycle some W87 bits and W87-1, but there aren't enough. Um, as a Trump uh, administration official, formerly an Obama official, said to me in Washington once, all of this is a very expensive and elaborate way to keep Livermore Lab, uh, well, alive, rich. Not it would remain alive, but high clover was uh, my summary of this uh, statement. So Livermore needs a um, a warhead to design, and after the current set of uh, warheads and bombs. There will be nothing for the NNSA, uh, the National Nuclear Security Administration warhead complex to actually do. So there has to be another warhead, and especially a Livermore warhead. And after the Livermore warhead, there is to be another Los Alamos warhead. Um, so uh, without the continual flow, then, um, then people have to be laid off. So the key takeaways now are as follows. The LANL is getting a new production mission. Los Alamos has been a research and development lab almost entirely. And this changes the nature of Los Alamos lab. And they all know it. They talk about it openly. Uh, I was at a conference of nuclear executives in Washington where I got COVID. Um, but it was a, you know, some time ago now. Um, and uh, they openly say that we are adding the equivalent of the Argonne National Laboratory to LAM. A whole other national laboratory scale effort is being grafted onto LAM. And so um, another conclusion, these you could say are conclusions, LANL's mission, this new mission is rather absurd, we think, uh, and vulnerable. Um, and uh, it has failed before, uh, four times. If you, um, you could, you know, there are four times, four clear times. And if it were a business, um, it, you could say that it would, it's failing right now. For political, fiscal, and social reasons, it is going to be impossible to meet our climate and environmental goals 
while carrying this kind of defense burden. So it comes to um, it comes to seven thousand eight hundred and sixty dollars per U.S. household right now. Uh, Congress just passed a, a um, defense authorization bill, and if you add in the other bits, it is very within about one percent of one trillion dollars. Last year it was nine hundred and thirty-four billion, and this year it's going to be very, very close to one trillion. There are 128 million households in, in the United States, so there you have it: seven thousand eight hundred dollars and change for every household. Well, this could buy a lot of social programs and environmental programs, and as you know, um, it's by far the largest. Uh, military outlay for uh, of any country. Um, the, and this because this land omission is key to the US pretense to be a global empire, and because it's vulnerable, that means that Santa Fe and northern New Mexico are in a very interesting place in terms of making a material contribution to peace and social development, which is, and that is why we are here, why we came tonight. Um, that'll, there we go. So, Los Alamos is the only place that can make these pits in the 2020s and early 2030s. So, there is a second Hit factory that is bigger, safer, more modern, but it's not already extant. It's, it's farther from being a fait accompli. It's in South Carolina. And it can't come online until 2032 at the earliest. So this early pit production helps uh, goose the entire nuclear complex for the critical next decade or more. Um, the pits that Lanel makes, because the Lanel facilities are old and small and crowded, they can't make enough pits actually to carry any warhead project. So they can't, they can't make enough to um, build W87 ones. They can contribute, but they can't do the whole thing. So they're going to build the one in Savannah River, no matter what. Um, and, they, and there's not enough. The Los Alamos uh, facilities won't last long enough to support the stockpile uh, in the 2030s and 2040s when they actually might need some pits. So there are senior staff in Congress and even in the Pentagon who understand all this. But they're in the minority, and uh, they're, I can't even say who they are, they're vulnerable. Um, we have a broader objective in mind, and we, which we want to help be a part of a broader political awakening. Uh, that involves climate and environmental consciousness and social justice. We see all these as closely connected. The people who want pits in the 2030s, 2040s, 2050s, uh, they are basically, they deny that, they, they deny everything. Climate change, whatever, the normalcy bias, you might say. Um, so we think it's quite important to assert humane values here and now. Now, how do we do this? Well. Um, we've done a lot of things in the last 32 years, and uh, I can confidently say that you're not going to be able to pick up the phone and call Senator Heinrich and change his mind. Uh, that is not going to happen. There was recently a, a petition with 300,000 names on it that went to Senator Heinrich, and he blew it off. And. So we're not going to we're not going to get that far, and we're not going to count on that. 
Um, the military, industrial, congressional intelligence, media, academic think tank complex, <laughs> coinage of uh, Ray McGovern, um, is very powerful and it basically uh, rules over the normal constitutional government. And uh, it's, you might say, well, it's harmless to write a letter and so on. But it's not really harmless because it, it indicates to the recipient that you are naive. And then if you also get other people to do it, it saps energy from other things that people might do. So we have uh, gradually come to the view that, um, that it's dangerous to be naive. Um, and we have the same problem in oil and gas, big pharma, finance. Uh, it's, they are basically out of control. And the, so the, the sum of it all is that we're in an emergency situation. And we're going to have to uh, revisit our priorities, our personal priorities, and have some family meetings. We had a family meeting at breakfast time, which we didn't really count on having, but we did. Um, we, uh, we have family members who work in the nuclear weapons complex. And one, uh, they're thinking of quitting. Um, and interestingly, it's not because they've become peaceniks. It's because they don't believe in the vaccine mandate. And this is something which should alert us to the possibility of relationships and alliances where we haven't seen them before. Um, and so um, this is a, I say here, serious money is also needed. You probably hear because you've seen some advertising and thanks to generous donors we were able to do that, large and small. Um, and because we're having a terrible time getting this information out there. And we're very grateful to those donors and um, we hope we can keep it up. But at the same time we know that there's nothing like real people. Um, people in the street, people doing, um, putting their priorities aside and um, in any number of different ways trying to uh, cut through our present paralysis. Um, now I want to make this a little bit concrete. Uh, one Lionel Pitt will cost at least $50 million. Um, the you don't have to just, you know, here's spreadsheets, um, and so, and a, a whole year of working on this, they're spending uh, more than a billion on this now, and uh, you could, uh, for one pit is, could stimulate, let's say, about eight or 9,000 residential solar installations. I think I saw an article this morning. The, the city here has got some a program like 600, 600 uh, solar installations, something like that. We need to bump everything up by an order of magnitude in our efforts to protect the climate and generate a more equitable society. And we can't make it if we're spending a billion dollars a year on more nuclear weapons. And which would buy um, between 150 and 200,000 residential solar systems at four kilowatts, which is the size of ours and is enough. We have a big house and an office in there, and uh, that supplies all our needs. Um, and as you know, you've seen if, um, one pit. The price of one put, pit would would pay the salary of. In New Mexico, a thousand school teachers. Um, Bushra, yes, just for brief, yes. Is that fifty million dollars per pit based on historical pricing? No, there's no historical precedent for what's happening. So it's a um, at Lanel. Um, I'll just tell you, 
Um, the high end estimate, and there's not that much difference between the high and the low, and the high is always more predictive than the low. Um, the total uh, that Lanell expects to spend on pit production through 2033 is a little over 20 billion. The, um, that would be startup and production through 2033. Um, total through 2028, when they would finish their main capital projects, uh, is 14 billion. Um, this is the uh, plutonium facility, the main plutonium facility at Lionel right here. So pits are, <clears throat> the hardest part of making pits takes place in that building. This is the view from the north. Um, we legally took this picture from a high altitude with a long lens. Trish did. Um, this little building right here is a $1.4 billion project. It's not finished. Um, this pit, or sort of a pit right here, was to be um, a, another huge building. And I'm pleased to say that we played a significant role in stopping that through litigation. We stopped it until uh, everybody in Congress began to realize it was stupid. This whole thing is happening is stupid. So we have the same situation. We can just slow it down a little bit. It's very crowded there. And that's the, that's the thing you should get out of it. There's a lot of people who are working on this. That's the new parking lot that you see and the brand new parking structure. Lanel told us in, uh, at the conference in August that they needed five or six parking structures like that. And, but they, their analysis says that the road network in northern New Mexico won't support that many cars and trucks. So they now want a fleet of uh, coach-class buses that will bring two to 3,000 people to the lab every day. And they want uh, trailer parks or man camps at the, on the Indian Pueblos to house people, and they have begun negotiations uh, with Nambe, Pawaki, and San Alfonso. Uh, that's a nuclear waste dump in the foreground, that big field. There you see. So this is a close-up of, uh, this is the building over there, the $1.4 billion dollar supposedly light lab, but they changed the purpose of it after they built it, after prom promising us that would never happen. Um, that's a tunnel there that goes uh, into it. <clears throat> this is a view from the north, and those are homes. Those are trailer park. That's the trailer park there in Los Alamos. Um, it's another high rent place. It's not cheap. Um, but So that's 3,000 feet from Holmes to the plutonium facility, which is the same distance as it is Holmes in Livermore, California, which is in the middle of the suburbs. Here's a different view showing the western part of the area there, um, that old building there, radiochemistry building, uh, is, um, that one, the mouse here. Um, is old and contaminated, and I don't know how long that will last. Um, Lanel plans to build on the this area here, uh, cafeteria and training center. So they have to hire 2,000 more people on top of the 2,000 people they already have working on pit production and related things, and they have to house them, feed them, train them. There's a close-up of the main plutonium facility and uh, the take-home message here is, again, this is a very crowded site. This is not the kind of layout that you want to see for a factory, especially one which they anticipate running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, those odd extensions, and I, I don't understand this, so this is a place I don't understand. Uh, those are, we are told, loading docks, and they are deficient. Um, this whole production plan is contingent on a tight choreography 
of just-in-time deliveries, people, um, the vault is very small, the loading docks are small, and there are other problems which I can't talk about, which will probably be written about in the next few months. Um, but this is not at all an ideal production plant. It was a built for research and development. There's another view. Um, uh, another view. This is where the waste, uh, this is the new waste. Uh, there are metal buildings. Um, I don't know what it would cost if we built this. Uh, um, Don used to build things. Uh, that's like a $120 million project. Um, and it still has problems. Um, so I know that the edit, former editor of Journal North, he, oh my god, the Butler building. And <laughs> um, then this is where the whip trucks are loaded. You can see some there. That's the rant facility, which you may read about in the paper. Um, or, okay, this is a new housing development uh, with the nuclear waste dump in the background. Uh, we, you know, we can we call it transuranic trails, or um, and so, uh, and this uh, this is interesting because this is not yet in the budget. So uh, the figures which I gave to you about cost don't include replacement of this complex here, which is dates from the fifties. It does not meet seismic standards. And it is slated for um, the beginning of the rest, replacement in 2026. This is a whole other thing. This is a uh, leak to us a few weeks ago. Um, and this is what it looks like, what the, these big projects look like in their initial phases. Um, so CD0 cost range low to high, 3.4 billion. You can count on that doubling. That is a new plutonium facility. It's a gigantic project. It's at Lanville. And we don't know a thing about it. That's all. Um, power line. Los Alamos is doubling its power capacity. And so you can't really see it very well, but I think that's it. Yeah. This is the power line crossing, the present power line crossing. And Power lines uh, have right of ways, right of ways have scars, and uh, they would like to have a new, uh, they want to put the, a new power line parallel to that one. Um, it would be not parallel to that one over by the Norton substation, but here it runs in a parallel track. That's White Rock in the background. Earlier, they wanted to have a new uh, road and bridge because they have terrible transportation problems. So this uh, was presented um, two years ago, and uh, that's, a not, that's not quite right. It was subsequently shared with the public, late eventually. Um, this, I suppose, is the Waldo exit. That's the Lava Hill. Um, so that's a pretty extensive set of new highways, and it's a big bridge. Um, and in case anyone thinks that's just somebody's pipe dream, that's a report from the Legislative Finance Committee uh, recommending that the state commit to the project. Um, that happened seven months before Lanell showed that uh, thing. It disappeared after that. The Trump administration killed it, actually. What are the units? Uh, millions. The our Trump administration uh, a budget analyst said uh, we had a discussion about this and, and the view of the White House is not one more effing dime for the overpaid Los Alamos scientists. We pay them to make bombs, not ease their commutes in their vacation wonderland to their vacation wonderland homes or something like that. <laughs> not everybody loves the lab. Uh, this was just, uh, what, nine days ago, a presentation from, uh, from the new area manager. The key thing here is the, this is the Los Alamos pit production, P4. Plutonium pit production, 
project. Yeah. Hiring an additional 2,000 people. Um, so that's, uh, and they want to get reach eventually 30 bits per year. Not, not a lot. So what will it cost? Well, I've already kind of said that, but um, so the startup cost for the two-site plan, they built two Rocky Flatses, they're in the range of 32 to 39 billion through uh, 2033, and more than half of that is Atlanta. So Atlanta's the small site with the crappy facilities, but it would absorb more than half the money. Because, the reason is because it has to go around the clock. And so they have 4,000 people, 4,000 people in Atlanta cost a billion dollars. Um, hold on. Um, in South Carolina, they will have 1,800 to 1,900 people, and they will have one shift, and they will be able to make all necessary bits with one shift and 1,800 to 1,900 people. Um, now, how does this compare with other things we've built here in the state in constant dollars? It's vastly more. You know, there's the list. The big guy. Um, this is approximately the same. This was a different initial reference, but it's about the same uh, amount of money. So huge projects that have taken place in the state amount to only small percentages of this money in cost of all. Uh, this is part of a runaway budget for nuclear warheads. So this is an out of control program. And Trump was blackmailed um, and this is slide is actually a year out of date. The numbers on the right there are a little bit higher. Um, but the, um, the Cold War average uh, is in here. And it's only after the Cold War that the Congress has lost control over these budgets and programs. And uh, especially there under Trump, he was very vulnerable and biddable, let's say. People ask, what does Lanel do? That's really important for audiences that don't, I mean, we, we hear all oh, they're doing, you know, research <laughs> on this and that. Nearly everything at Lanel is nuclear weapons. So you hear a lot of stuff, but for the most part, it's nuclear weapons. So the, the media presence of the lab is different than its funding profile. <laughs> Um, cleanup we hear a great deal about, um, it's about 5% of the total. Um, work for others, though it's primarily defense. Okay, okay quite, so we are at a place where we should stop. Um, that's, now we have, oh, yeah, okay. They failed before, that was, you know, that was one thing. Uh, this is not a new idea, that's a 1993 uh, news article. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip past those and come to the end. Okay. Questions then? <laughs> uh, comments? This is happening right now in North Carolina. In, um, in, in South Carolina. Oh, is it? South Carolina. Okay. They were, they were talking about the exact same thing. But they're not going to build until 2024. I'm going to say some things and I'm very able to be, able to be happy, but I want to say it because it's truth. Uh, you've seen the recent buildings in San Fed. Everybody has seen the, the infill and all the large apartment complexes going up. Uh, uh, Mayor Weber and the Santa Fe City Council were alerted, alerted by uh, Ben Ray Lujan and uh, Martin Heinrich of a transfer of 5,000 employees to New Mexico to work on this project. Mm -hmm. There wasn't enough housing in Los Alamos, as you can see, or in Española, so the, the rush came to Santa Fe uh, and as a result of that we have these huge 
apartment units being built. The units initially are uh, said they're going to be affordable housing. So then everybody feels good because anybody here can afford to rent a plane. They get permitted and then the developer is allowed to buy out of, how, of the affordable housing, which means that the units are locked in at about 18 to 25 for starting rents. In Santa Fe, I don't know a lot of people that make $1,800 a month just for rent. And the reason the people from out of town that are encouraged, they're being transferred here. They don't have a choice. They're being transferred to work on this project, but they have government salaries so they can afford those rents better than we could, uh, for sure. Um, recently, the entire uh, Washington, Northern New Mexico delegation uh, endorsed uh, Alan Weber for mayor. Those are the same individuals that are working on this project and have endorsed it. Uh, so I feel really bad because I voted for him. So we're stuck. Now how do we don't get on stuff, but we do something. And we don't know the next step. Um, so we really, I think, all have to figure out how this is going to impact us and our quality of life. Many, many years ago, they were going to transport material from Los Alamos to WIP. We fought WIP too. And um, everybody said, no, 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 can't come to Santa Fe, we're not going to have that. In no time at all, we had 599 as the safety feature. So this is going on, and, and our congressional delegation is part of it. And it's about money because that's what things like this generate. And I came tonight because I don't know you, but I want to come in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Nancy Bresnay, and I worked as a caregiver up in White Rock for one of the men who worked at the lab for 37 years. Can you speak up? Yeah he, yeah, he was an electrical engineer. He worked in the weapons department, was a derivatives uh, cl classifier, and he breathed in uranium hexafluoride in an accident, and that cooks your lungs from inside out. So my worry is, what if those nuclear weapons or the gases escape? Yes. That's I, what I worry about. Yes, I didn't even touch on that, and let me just uh, reply um, that that's very important. So there have been, the Department of Labor has certified as of, what was the year, Trish? Um, maybe um, uh, 2016, 20? Yeah. yeah, it was 16 or 17. Yeah. Yes, about five years ago. Um, 1,600 occupational deaths at Lambda. That's not the illnesses, which are many more. <clears throat> um, the, there is no external regulator in the normal sense of the term. Like if you work for, even for Walmart, uh, in principle you are under the jurisdiction of OSHA. But there's no OSHA at Los Alamos. They are exempt. So all we have is the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board, which advises Congress and the DOE, and they have influence, definitely, and they really do try to stick up for the workers and the public, but they don't have formal regulatory power. So they make recommendations, and the, we are concerned that the production pressures which go with this mission will erode what safety standards there are. And Trish knows a man who had something similar happen. And from that one event, he was never okay. There's a, there's a lot of organizations, though, with like the water is life uh, idea that have cleansed water in different you. places. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe they'd, they'd be able to help. Yes. Pipeline protests were like that too. Yes. yes. Maybe so. More. Others. 
Greg? Yes. Just as a comment with regard to that, with all these injuries, there, I'm sure that there's a lot of you who, who know some of this, but you may not know how big it really was with Rocky Flats and the number of injuries and deaths that were there and why Rocky Flats was shut down. We are facing something even bigger than Rocky Flats is, and that's what this is, is another Rocky Flats. It's not different. and uh, In fact, it's worse. So, um, and, and if you want to know just how horrendous that was, and it took, <laughs> who, was it the FBI, Greg, that came in? Yeah, and, yes, yeah they, they, it, it took a raid by the FBI to yeah. shut down Rocky Flats. Had they not done that, there was every possibility with the, the things that were happening there that it would have contaminated Denver. Denver at that particular point. Uh, so we're, we're right in that area, folks. Don't, don't even think that that's not a possibility. It is. Michelle? Well, Los Angeles has a terrible safety record. Um, and I'm thinking about the accident they had at WIP. One small thing that shut them down for, what, three years? Mm -hmm. um, and pretty soon there will be something that just shuts the whole thing down. Mm -hmm. And to pick a place that has such a terrible safety record is really stupid. And yes. Yeah. Very. It's, it reflects that desperation. So this is not a normal kind of, this is not the way government uh, would operate if it were in its you know, better uh, frame of mind. But they're really concerned about Russia and China and this is a new Cold War. And so we are waking the wolf in the, in the way of, this is what one senior analyst who uh, works for Congress, um, a federal civil servant, said to me, he said, the production sites, they like having a mission, they like real stuff to do, but there's a danger that we are waking the wolf in the domestic dog. And that's what, uh, and <clears throat> later, and just the other day, he said, now you know that working on this at night is inherently more dangerous than working on it in a daytime shift. Yeah, okay. Um, oh, yes, no. Um, I remember this summer, I think on NPR, they were saying something about the, that they were releasing something into the air. Um, yeah. Do you recall what that was and was that yeah. an issue? Yeah. They, was never, it, they was did it, actually. They did, yeah. They well, did, did. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's um, tritium. It's, uh, you know, in a place like this, there's a constant, um, there's the little stuff that happens. And some of it's not so little. But um, that was one of those little things. Los Alamos really, we don't think, should have a tritium capability. Um, and once there is a big one at Savannah River, and it has problems down there. Um, but uh, there, our tritium facility is right correctly on an earthquake fault. It's in the uh, next to Bandelier over by the Ponderosa campground. And uh, they have bottles there that they have neglected, and now they are building up pressure, and now <coughs> they are afraid uh, that they could blow up. And so they'll have to release something, filter it if they can, and so that's what that was. I should say something about the parallel project in Savannah River. Our, those of you who weren't here at the beginning, we were supposed to have a Zoom guest speaker, but he bailed at, uh, at, at the last minute uh, because he's, he's afraid of losing uh, close connections with uh, the NNSA. Um, so, um, close connections with what? He he works with uh, the NNSA closely, okay. which is why he's a good speaker. Um, but uh, uh, he doesn't want to be too public. Um, so this uh, this is a talk from August. I, we just pulled a couple of slides, and um, I was at this talk. Uh, that's there. Uh, 
the, the core of their plutonium uh, building is 500,000 square feet. It's about um, five times the size of uh, the one you saw at Los Alamos. And they, it was partly built for another purpose, but that program was canceled. So here they are about four or five billion dollars into this project and um, they are re Piping, they're going to repipe, rebuild, etc. You'll see. So there it is under construction, and you can see the scale of it. It is huge. And the site itself is huge. It's 310 square miles. This facility is 10 times as, uh, yes, 10 times as far to the edge of the site as uh, Los Alamos' plutonium facility. They had six villages that they can you hold on just to finish this and then so that's their that's what would be left after they do the demolition and then that's what they need to build. So they that's where they're going. And then I think I have another picture. Nope. That's their staffing requirement. <clears throat> the blue are the people doing the operations, the yellow the yellow are construction. Um, and they have um, about 645 people working on this right now. Um, okay, this is a big issue, and I'm using the Savannah River site to illuminate it, but it's a huge issue here. Who's going to do this work? Well, it's not that easy. And it is a lot easier there than here because there is a lot of industry, including chemical industry, in the area. And very close by. Nuclear power too. And nuclear power plant. You can see the nuclear power plant from and they're just finishing construction. So this is the type of people, and this was also part of the presentation in Los Alamos the other night. We're not, these are not necessarily uh, primarily scientists that are going to be these are people who have their hands in the glove boxes operating uh, numerically controlled uh, machinery and but uh, many of them are also highly trained, and some of them are not. And how, where to get these people is a huge preoccupation of this industry. They have a huge labor issue. Especially people who are citizens. Yes, exactly. And they don't, you know, they don't want a drug history. They don't want a crime history. You have to <clears throat> meet uh, human reliability um, programs. So. They have people from Savannah River training now in Atlanta. So that's their first uh, group of graduates who are training at the, the Lano facility. That's a better picture of the project over there. Um, they are filtering their air emissions through a gigantic sand filter, which is how they've done it there in the past. Uh, not through an uh, industrial HEPA filter like you might see around here because they have the space. Um, and so it's a huge project. It's an $11 billion project, a uh, capital project over there. And uh, what else? OK. That's, uh, that's all I really need to say about Savannah River, unless you have some questions about it. But that's, I, I guess, the main thing. I guess this next slide is the main thing. And you can hardly read it. It has too many words. Apologize. <clears throat> they, because Los Alamos can't make enough pits to support anything like the present U.S. stockpile, and because it is the present where all these decisions are being made, not an idealized future, this is going to be built in Savannah River. And the only question open is whether we're going to build another one here to jumpstart this whole thing with a crash program. And that is why this is vulnerable and why it is stupid. Hmm. Yes. So now I've done it on Savannah River. If, yes, sir. Well, coincidentally, there seems to be some sort of public relations uh, campaign going on right now. And in fact, tomorrow at the nuclear uh, museum that's in Albuquerque, yes. they're hosting an outdoor film um, a screening, and then they're going to have beer, and they're going to have all kinds of great, it's going to be very family oriented, it says, and then, the, then it's going to be, I think the film they're presenting is the Modern Marvels, uh, a Modern Marvels episode, 
uh, on the Manhattan Project. And they're, they're going to basically sell this thing. And then the second thing they're going to do inside the museum is screen another film. Uh, it's a short, I think, 45 minute film on Alamogordo. Oh. So that's another big one. So I can already sense what, what I'm seeing right now, especially with, it looks like, it looks like pretty much Alan Weber's their guy. He's like the shoe in. And so they've got everything, all the, oh, they're getting all their ducks in a row. The, the, the Midtown Campus uh, project hasn't gone away. It's, I thought the, Beck, the Beckner Road extension or uh, project was still in, it's still there. It's yeah. hanging in yeah. in limbo right now. It hasn't yeah. gone away. Yeah. So yeah. it's seen, and then there's the lady over here mentioned uh, with all these uh, developments of all these high rises and these building projects. It sounds like they've got everything in the works. Yeah. So it doesn't seem to me like it's going away. So I'm I came here to see well what are our options? I mean it doesn't yeah. could we try to do something to yeah. kind of like throw Alan Weber's campaign on, off? Yeah. Something, yeah. I mean, I don't know, I mean, I don't know, it's just, yes. anyway. Yeah. Sure. Uh, well, I don't yeah. see that, oh, sorry, I don't see that you put it here in the presentation, but the, the point of stopping it at Lanel and the delay in the start at Savannah River is delay. That's the key word here. As long as we can delay, yeah. delay, delay, Congress may come around. That's how we defeated the plutonium facility the last time. Okay. And we've defeated a few others. And so we want to stop it at Los Alamos for Congress to get their head on straight and stop this damn thing. The, the, yes. And those are all true things that you have said. And the, the lab was meeting with Mayor Weber, we have emails, uh, way before any of this ever came out in public. There were meetings four or five years a long time ago, and meetings at, what's his face, his house? Uh, uh, the guy from California, he's the developer. Because uh, uh, he's out of state, I don't know that. No. Uh, anyway, maybe I'll come to me. Um, you guys think of it. Uh, yeah. Anyway, the head of Christus St. Vincent, um, senior administrators UNM, mm -hmm. Alan Weber, yep. uh, the lab, Sandia, uh, they were all coming uh, mm -hmm. to breakfast and they had a series of meetings about how to create housing, yeah. how to uh, push this project forward. And we got them from the city of Santa Fe uh, from MIPRA requests, but nobody wants to cover it in the newspaper. So Greg, I wanted to say something just real quick to with what you're talking about, what we can do. When you're talking about these things that are happening down at the museum and you said family oriented, that's another big key factor here. When, you're, when uh, Trish was talking about delaying, the, the one thing that you can do, it, that you could do just with any, anybody in this room, if you've got kids, you've got grandkids, you've got friends who have kids, the fact that what they're doing here, that family orientation thing, that's pipeline. And it's because they're trying to take as many of our children as they possibly can. So that's another way that you can help other people to, to join in to creating the delay that, that is here. Yes, ma'am. The previous slide showed that uh, the Livermore Lab had political opposition. What was that based yeah. on? Where, where? The the Pitt there, in other words, the Oh, yes. Uh, and yes. Can uh, we do that? Yes, <laughs> right. What was the opposition? Could you yes, you okay. <laughs> you know. So, uh, I have to go back 30 years to very near the end of the beginning of this organization. Uh, the Carl Braithwaite from Los Alamos Lab took two of us out to lunch and he said Livermore Lab is going to be the clean lab and Los Alamos is going to be the dirty lab mm -hmm. and there's nothing you can do about it so you might as well give up hmm. and the uh, it uh, that's because California uh, is serious, uh, more serious about environmental regulation, and the population won't stand for it. 
So Livermore Lab is surrounded by houses mostly on the north side, light industry, and ranching on the east side. But that's filling in too with suburbs. And there's also faults. There's more seismic even than Los Alamos. <laughs> and there's, um, they, they have a plutonium facility, but they have derated it down to uh, less than two kilograms of plutonium. They could conceivably make pits there, but it would take a lot of investment, it would take a lot of years, and, and it will never happen because of all of those uh, activists in suburbs of California. I think also the uh, great. Is, is more powerful than that. It has, it varies, it, it uh, has been, yes, and right now they have, uh, they have a slogan called, you know, NNSA is the federal agency that, that runs all this. So they have a slogan called, we are one NNSA. What does that mean? That means everybody is going to do what they're told. And Los Alamos is the production agency for Livermore's design. So we do the dirty work, they are designing this warhead. And so they will come and do the quality assurance on what Lennel makes. And that's how this relationship is working out for this, for this the decade or more that it will take. Los Alamos will also be making these pits. So when, uh, excuse me, great. Yes. So, okay, so I took part in the mm -hmm. grassroots movement that, that opposed the reprocessing facility in eastern New Mexico. And thank God that that thing has, it hasn't fully gone away, but they've yes. renamed it, repackaged it. But it sounds to me, I mean, the fact that they built the enrichment facility in Lovington, or down in Lee County, mm -hmm. I don't know exactly where in Lee County, mm -hmm. and they got the enrichment facility. Holtec, yes. Holtec hasn't gotten away with its proposal to bring, basically create a radioactive waste dump down in the southeast and west Texas. Right. And then WIP is there, so ideally. So I know that with the reprocessing facility, the issue, the main issue with logistics was transportation of this, of this waste. So it seems to me that ideally it would be, I mean, it would be ideal to create a one-stop shop for all the bad stuff, the dirty stuff that you're referring to in one state like New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And so it, it just, this is incredible. We've been dealing this with this, I, I've been dealing with it since George Bush's, just George Bush yes. Jr.'s time. Yes. And so it's like, okay, so where to now? Because this, yes. this train keeps going. That's and right. it hasn't stopped. Yes, you, you're absolutely right, and you're raising, and I, you're raising the, the two, in both of your comments, I, you know, I have to say that we are the designated nuclear colony. Mm -hmm. And it's not really just an exaggeration or anything. That really is exactly what's happening. And it's not just the federal people who are doing it, but it's also mainstream Democrats, mainstream nonprofits, People in Washington, you know, New Mexico doesn't look very big or important from Washington. Not very many electoral votes, not many Congress people, and it's, it's as what somebody said to me a long time ago when I was moving back here, well, it's just, you know, 300,000 300, acres or, of kitty litter. And that's how, you know, that's how it was seen from back east. And the, they, NNSA and DOD want a place where they can do all this. But the two major factors that make us a key selling or an ideal destination for all of this, I think, is the fact that the Manhattan Project, I mean, it took part, there were different segments of it that took part around the country, but this is where it was developed, and this is where they triggered the yes. first atomic device. So they're like, you know what, we've done the damage, let's do it there again. Or I heard this from uh, editors of newspapers who are uh, sitting editors of newspapers. Now, and they say, oh, it's the Manhattan Project has run the state ever since 1945. There's no point in fighting it. We just have to get the best deal we can. Okay. That is uh, what a newspaper editor said to, were you the one, Lydia or Trish might have been there. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, but this is actually much bigger than the Manhattan Project. Yes. This, in constant dollars, is like six times as big as the Manhattan Project. Wow. And it's, uh, when they came, they only wanted a few hundred people. It gradually grew, gradually grew. But at the time, it was still temporary. 
and it didn't actually control the civil government of the state, and it hadn't insinuated itself into so many of our institutions. And the fear we have is that, that we will lose our autonomy in civil society altogether, and, you know, back there in D.C., well, you know, New Mexico, they have their nuclear, uh, well, there's over $6 billion a year being spent on nuclear weapons in New Mexico. Why do they need other federal money? Let's just keep, you know, give them enough to, to keep them happy, and they're the nuclear state. And so you're, yes, it's, and what do we do? We have got to make, well, uh, yes, yes sir. Has a question. My question relates to the gentleman's uh, comments as well, which is what, what is their plan to deal with all the waste that this is going to generate? Yeah. That's a terrific question. <laughs> and the uh, Senate Armed Services Committee just released their report on the forthcoming National uh, Defense Authorization Act. It isn't fully passed, but it's all but passed. They asked, well, what are we going to do with waste? Uh, they said, we're not sure that there's enough capacity and whip for this waste. So this at Los Alamos will make 2,000 containers, uh, drums, let's say, of transuretic waste every year um, at the August conference, that's what they said. So f since WIP has opened, the dominant shipments of waste from Lanel have has been brand new waste from plutonium operations. The actual removal of waste from the cleanup project has been very little in comparison. Hmm. And now with this starting up, it's already generating a lot of waste and it dominates the whip shipments from Lanham. So we've got uh, about 18,000 drums hmm. already packaged. Mm -hmm. uh, some are underground, mm -hmm. uh, most are underground, but they're, they're in drums. Mm -hmm. And some are in the tents that you see from here. Probably we got on the roof, we could see it if it were in the daytime. And, but there's no plan. There's absolutely no coherent or budgeted plan to get that waste out of there and get it underground. It's just an aside that the San Onofre nuclear plant that's been shut down has a huge amount of waste that's dangerously sitting there and there's a big push to have that sent to New Mexico. Yes, and it, that's right. So the the the, um, the question of whether the state will be uh, a or the site for a consolidated storage facility for spent commercial nuclear fuel is remains quite alive. And let's see, uh, sir. So um, just just seems like a bad deal for Los Alamos, and uh, right now Los Alamos is like one of the richest counties in the country. Uh, mm -hmm. Fabulous schools, very upper middle class, um, people from all over the world come and do their research. And to now become a very dirty manufacturing plant in the middle, in the midst of them, with 2,000 workers coming from trailer parks, you know, it reminds me of Deadwood. It reminds me of like a mining town that, that now you've got 2,000 workers who really aren't at all the Los Alamos vibe, the type. So to me, the way to defeat this seems to me for the upper, you know, echelon workers that make two, three hundred thousand dollars a year to realize this is a bad deal for their little town, their little paradise, and to, and to them to say, wait 10 years and put it in South Carolina, or let's actually adhere to the nuclear weapons treaties that have just been passed, mm -hmm. that we shouldn't be building any of these anyway. Exactly. We should be getting rid of our nuclear weapons, yeah. not building more. And that is a, that's a, that's a pretty good idea. And it, the, the character of Los Alamos has changed over the last three decades, not for the better, we would say. 
Um, there used to be a fair number of dissidents there, people who uh, would fight back against the unreasonable authority. There are very few of them now. The fear is great. Um, there are some. And there could be more uh, if we were, um, it's a project, you know. It's a big project. And if people have time uh, to pursue it, that's, that would be good. And we have, and we will, and we try. But the, you stick your neck out up there, and it's chopped off pretty quickly. You lose your friends, you lose your job, you, um, now retirees on the other hand, um, are much more free and there's a lot of them. So um, there's, the issue there has a lot to do with the way the decisions are made and issues are brought out into the public. So we have a bigger, bigger democracy deficit that's going on everywhere. They're a little better at it actually than, lately than under <clears throat> Mayor Weber's uh, Santa Fe, um, where you, but there, all of the local governments are now in the habit of, of, during and after COVID of doing stuff privately. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and, you know, yeah. yeah. So there's a cabal of people at and the Los Alamos County Council who are very close to the lab, and they, the lab talks to them. They talk to the rest of the council privately and they vet stuff. And then a lot of stuff never sees the light of day. So the, the site plan for Los Alamos that, that would tell the community what exactly is going to happen has never been released to the Los Alamos County Council. And they have never demanded to see. They have, certain members of the council have been vouchsafed a few views in private discussions and they're reassured about this or that, and then it takes a kind of a certain personality to step up and say, you're a bad partner, DOE. You're not telling us anything. Well, there was a person like that, and he left the council, and now it's smooth again. The waters are quiet. Anyway. As many um, keep going. Keep going. Uh, yes. Uh, Virginia. Virginia, yes. Sorry. Um, you mentioned that Christus St. Vincent yes. was a supporting group of all this? Yes. Don't they get it? I'm sure they get it that this is a negative impact on health. I believe the, the yes. The health system Are there any care institutions that uh, oppose all of this? Hmm. I, I, I think it's insane that Christus St. Vincent would support all of this. The CEO was a former lab person. Oh my God. Oh, I'm sorry. The CEO of Christus St. Vincent at the time and possibly at present, I'm not sure, was, I think we looked her up, she was a former lab staff person, senior staff person oh, from Lynn. Lynn? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and my, I, this has now been a few years, so yeah, my memory's... Yeah, I'd have to look it up again. Yeah, I'd have to look I'm it up. I'm not sure. Well, yeah. Are there any major, major, major institutions? No, none. Is, not a one. No, they just oppose this. None. None. Just this group? Let's see. Yes, <laughs> that, that is kind of the whole point. Yeah. And it, exactly. And the... Um, in Washington, this slide happened to be left up, there are people who kind of get this. And they are getting them to speak up. Yeah. Is, uh, so the last time, I have to tell you, the last, the, when the plug was pulled on the last pit factory at Los Alamos, the designated party to brief Congress to sort of break the news was the U.S. Strategic Command. They didn't want it. The Pentagon didn't want it. And why? Because it squandered so many billions that they were going to, that, that one way or other was going to come out of their budget. And that's what's going on here too. This, these billions will come out of the military budget. And to get you remember that chart with the red line that shot up there where Trump was blackmailed? 
the peop there were people in the military who were absolutely furious about that because it meant at least one submarine was being taken from them for that one submarine per year for that new higher amount. Well, they managed to get around that by goosing up the entire Pentagon budget. So they got their submarine. But that's when they get pissed off, then they really have clout. They have more clout than any of the local people, than NNSA and DOE. And when, when and if the money gets tight, or the supply chains are broken, or then uh, if, the, if the Joint Chiefs and the Secretary of Defense say, uh-uh, then it stops. Anyway. So how do we get them to do it? Right. We, when the other thing, if uh, Trish would say, and she, she's probably on the tip of her tongue, they don't do this kind of stuff where people don't want them. Right. They need public support. So we have to really right. They need public support. The talk by one, I'm, I'm sorry, the talk at this nuclear conference I attended by the Los Alamos person who's putting this together, the theme of the talk was local partnerships mm -hmm. and how important the local partnerships are in facilitating this entire effort. Right. It's a webinar here. Now. I think um, it's important to know that the letters to the editor are very important. Just this last Sunday in the New Mexican, there was a letter Mm. about how the, and I forget who in the government, which agency is trying to um, lessen the regulations on toxic chemicals oh. released at the He's lab. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Same um, one. so that was an educational piece and mm -hmm. I'm working on writing a letter back saying that, um, you know, how unhealthy that is for the surrounding communities, you know, to release, to make it, um, you know, less regulation yes. rather than more. And just a decade ago, I went up to an endocrinologist up there uh, for thyroid issue, and it came out in our discussion that thyroid cancer is just rampant mm. in the population <coughs> of lamel. And as you were suggesting back here, why are the residents of Los Alamos, you know, in research and design, living right. in this very dangerous environment? Money can't save their life. <laughs> so I think if we would just put letters to the editor about what our own personal issues are that, you know, about this project, and then bounce off each other's letter, letters that I think we can really reach out beyond this group. It's got to be more. It's got to be, can I say something? Of course. It's got to be a hundred, a thousand times more than that. Mm. Right. Show this, is, this is really, I'm going to stand up. I'm sorry. This is really critical. I can't stress it enough. We've been doing this for over 30 years. And it's just right now, right here, it's happening. It's happening, people. The climate, the all of our lives are in danger. And this has got to be stopped. I mean, people need to be in the streets. Yep. This isn't letters to the editor aren't gonna work. No. It's too it's damn slow. Look We've at what happened in London. We're going to have a demonstration on November the 5th out in front of the state capitol. And we want all of you to be there, bring another 100,000 people. Because we've got to tell Governor Grisham this will not work. We're not going to stand for it. Does she have any say in this? Well, she, she does. does. She does. The governors of the states are some of the most powerful people in the states. We can, so the governor can they're say, they're we they're don't they're want they're this they're in they're our governors, state anymore. The governors in other states have said, I'm going to lay down on the middle of the highway and I'm not going to let that nuclear waste into my state. Mm -hmm. And that's thing, she right? can stop. And the other thing, Stephen, will she do <laughs> that? Just by, demanding, just by demanding things like a site plan 
and what they're doing and all these things, it, it would at least start to make it more transparent. So, so a comment on this, and Chikame has made this point before. Um, let's see. I want to say the reason that uh, this waste is sitting up here is because other governors mm -hmm. went out there, they That's sent right. the state police out there yes. to keep the waste out of their state, and they said, by they God, it. you're not bringing this waste into our state unless you sign a binding agreement that it's leaving by a date certain. That's right. And that's why Idaho gets first place in sending its waste to WIP. And we do we never did that. We are like the, you know, sheep. Uh, yeah, we're the, we're uh, the sheep. And the, the, the other thing is to say about this is that when there is a sufficient there's nothing wrong, by the way, with writing letters together. That's very important. If there's enough of them and they're strong enough. But they do control that space, and it is not, um, it, it's a both and thing. But the, if enough people get in the, in the street or at a demonstration, and there is visibility in other states through the media, yes. and visibility to Congress, so we're, our delegation is not going to abandon this very easily. But other people on the Armed Services Committees and on the Appropriations Committees, especially, they see this news article, and because we'll give it to them, and they'll, then they'll turn to Senator Heinrich and say, look, your people don't even want this. So why, why are you insisting that we waste all this money on your stupid project when it's not even popular? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I want to say something to everybody here, just in case you haven't noticed, Deborah Hallen, who is our Interior Secretary, has not weighed in on anything. No. She hasn't endorsed anybody. She hasn't weighed in at all. I think she's extremely concerned about this going on to the Pueblos. And, and we see already uh, Elon Musk at Nambe, he brought the Tesla dealership in there because in order to sell cars, out here, you need to go through a dealership, but on the Pueblo, you don't. So we have a brand new uh, dealership at Nambe Pueblo with mm -hmm. Tesla's and a service place. But if you don't know what's going on, Lano rented two big office complexes in Santa Fe. The one over by the Vita de Guadalupe on Sandoval, and the one on Pueblo. Oh, yeah. The one on And Alameda. the one on Pacheco. Go by there and see what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They've gutted it. Yep. from top to bottom, mm -hmm. and there's going to be some activity there. And they, the total of three buildings, and they also want 100,000 square feet of light laboratory space for a biological laboratory. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. 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 I was very impressed by a center page ad announcing this. Yes. Whoever wrote it, whoever put it together, is very well done. All yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> My first thought after I read it was Chernobyl. I certainly didn't want to be part of that action. My second thought was J. Robert Oppenheimer's quote about death. That was the only word I remembered out of the whole quote. I have become death, that destroyer is. of worlds. And I thought that's what we're facing. We're beyond civil rights at this point. We're, we're in the face of human. Uh, Last human beings being on this planet, Are you the death and all for birds, for yeah. insects, for yes. flora and fauna, for people, for babies will become enormous. It's just a matter of time. And so they have this whole infrastructure, you know, already put in place more or less. Mm -hmm. And so I met that young lady over there who said, we need to get our children involved. We need to get our neighbors involved. If this November 5th is that what this yeah. I hope it's blasted on the media yeah. somehow so yeah. that people, each one of us here in this room should drag two people yes. at the minimum. Yes. Yeah. Ten. And that would be even better. Yes. We have to show our force as human yes, beings. Yes, we do. Yes. Amen. Yes, thank you. Remember Doris Bundy from the Albuquerque Center yes. for Peace and Justice. Yes. That's right. And they are in the street every day. That's, that's what On that? Yes, stand. Uh, yeah. uh, you said, 
I, I'm sure that many of you uh, saw the London uh, Existential Rebellion. Extinction uh, Rebellion? Yes. Oh, yeah. The outpouring oh, of people, common folk. Uh, I've, I've never seen the likes, and I think we can gender that here, too. Yes, uh, we can. And let's do it. It matters. When you ask if, what, if, they, if the governor will do something, the only time that our elected officials will actually do something is if we are, we are visibly present in very large numbers and that there, we've got some sort of media coverage that's going on. You can see it all the time. It's, it's everything that we see on the television, on, in the radio, in the newspaper, uh, on the internet, and that, that's when it makes a difference. And what Stan was just saying about this outpouring, that's what it takes, outpouring. And when, you know, Trish, Trish and I are pretty, pretty vocal and passionate about a lot of the things that we say and that we stand up here, and I'm so tired of feeling like I'm talking to the wall. Get up, stand up. You must get out into the streets and do these things. This is what it takes. But whenever yes. people with the Extinction Rebellion were screaming into the street, like, who decides? We decide. The time is now. And then they're getting arrested. And what all? And I ask, uh, like, why are we getting arrested? And, they, uh, and people, like, back away from me. And they don't answer my question. But nobody, nobody's talking. We're getting arrested, not having a discussion about like, is there a place that we can have collaboration space where we can start working on this and show up as we have time? Yes, yeah. that's, that's a good point. point. And well, yes. actually, the yeah. first, the whole first week of the rebellion was actually about come to the table. Yeah. They had tables. They had. Okay. They were trying to do discussions. That's they smart. had groups everywhere. So, and electronically, so just, they're they're ready to help. Yeah. So, yeah. so we yeah, got a call just before this meeting. Right. From a congressional staff person. Oh, sorry. We'll, we'll get. Oh, hold on just one second. We got a call just before this meeting from a congressional staff person that uh, Trish emailed inviting to the meeting. And I said, No, you can't come, but uh, please, you know, call. Let's have a talk. Well, that's how we, you know, that's how things happen. And something just happened in Albuquerque where. A coalition of 30 grassroots groups was more or less sold down the river by someone. Uh, they were going to have a demonstration and they ended up uh, signing on to the outcome was predetermined by a phone call and a meeting like that. And the grassroots group showed up and they were presented with the thing that they had agreed to, which was not something they would ever have agreed to. And. <laughs> Uh, that is how things have gone down here in this state, and so that is another reason why things need to be in the open, public, and uh, and some and collaborative in an open space. We want to know what Benry Lujan says about this. Does he know the least thing about it? Does his staff mem do his staff members know anything about it, or they have have they just turned their brains over to Lanel? Well, we know the answer, but we need to get back some of those brains so that we have some political will in the state to do something besides just what the lab tells us to do. Yes, sir. I'm just trying to think of a variety of ways. I thought that was a great concept, what you said about the tables bringing the table, just at least get the opposition to even listen to you for a little bit, you know? Right yeah. now, as polarized as we are, we've got these two, mid, we, got, we got these next, uh, is it the next midterm election that's coming up? We got our mayors up for re-election, our yeah. governors up for re-election. So I guess we could probably have some sort of power in influencing them, hopefully, maybe not financially, mm -hmm. but also the Danes came up with an interesting concept uh, called the human library. Uh, where you actually go to a, a, a meeting space and you are, you're, it, it, humans are replacing the books, you know, you people that come in and they can basically speak to us or speak to the specialists, you guys, about this issue, you know, so that people that really aren't sure, right now for them, they see all the positives of the labs, the money and other, you know, and right now with the economy being in recovery, the pandemic, the way it's working out, but what all I've seen in the papers lately with the Santa Fe, New Mexican and Lano 
is how they're fighting the mandate, you know, the mask mandate. And so, <laughs> so like, they, they have no problem being surrounded by this nuclear waste, but oh, they'll, 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 they'll fight yeah. the mask mandate. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I can tell you that before we had the the double page, the double truck ad in the Santa Fe Reporter, yeah. we had designed one and paid for it, a full page ad in the Santa Fe New Mexican, and they refused it. Oh, yeah, it's they all, rejected it. So we put I'm it. Surprised. So we put it in the Albuquerque Journal, a full page ad. Had to really pay the big bucks for that one. It would have been a lot less in the New Mexican, but then. The next day, we got a call from the New Mexican said, "Oh, good news! We've approved your ad." <laughs> so, because the report is an alternative weekly. It's, um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's why so, we got that double there. The um, the yes, the cost per viewer uh, in the reporter is one tenth of that of the New Mexican. Mm -hmm. But we but the we can't reach people as well as the combined forces of everybody through Facebook and through their contacts and that right now the information sphere is completely fragmented. Yeah, sure. yeah. Um, after 9-11 uh, we had um, radio ads and oh my gosh it was the radio audiences are sliced up mm -hmm. and you need a lot of money to play the game yeah. and it, and so it's uh, we <clears throat> You know, we don't have benefactors like that, and it's our tourism. Go to your next topic. What time is the thing on November 5th? At noon. At noon. Yeah. It's a Friday. All right. It's a Friday at noon. Yeah. Um, but let, I want to just uh, talk, talk about uh, another topic briefly, and then we'll and then we'll come to next steps. And that topic is the way in which. The, uh, it, in which issues have been divided up into silos. Now, um, it seems like the nuclear issue is separate from the climate issue, is separate from the social justice issue, um, but I can tell from the comments that you've made that you already know that's not true. And the, well, the problem we face in all these areas is that people aren't really standing up enough. That we have been paralyzed a little bit too much. And I know in the study group, we, became, we started out a lot more populist than we gradually became because we didn't have very much money. And the cheapest after you know, after a decade of work, then you develop a, you begin to know as much as a congressional staff member, and then they want to talk to you. So then you're a resource to them. So then the cheapest thing that you can do, the biggest bang for the buck, is to go back to DC and be a broker of information and help people communicate that are fighting, which uh, we do. And someone said, well, you you're it's like a minister. You're like pastor of one. <laughs> and uh, it's not, but I don't know now after COVID what kind of access or traction we have back there. It's very different back there now after the January 6th events and mm -hmm. so forth. The, but the point is that there's been a professionalization that's taken place and it takes place in NGOs like ours. And at the, same, as, at the same time, and in response to the disempowerment of the public that's gone on, the, the erosion of our democracy, and, but it's, it's not a process that can continue indefinitely, and it really has to be reversed. And we have to understand, as, as people have said here, that, uh, that especially uh, you, ma'am, that we are really at on the last legs yeah. of living planet Earth. Mm -hmm. We yeah. cannot let this slide. And from, uh, from some of us, uh, the years that uh, we have lived here, we, we can feel this a lot. It's our responsibility to do this. And so, so we don't think these issues are separate. 
at all. That's all. Go, go ahead, Nancy. Have we had any? Um, have we had any group like six or eight people even go before each um, staff representative of Ben Ray? And and uh, Heinrich and you know all of our representatives no, no, no. because I think we've got to do that and if we do it in group and we all have something to say I did it with a group in um, in all of our congressional offices on Red Rock Wilderness Act and we had strong support for that I know this is a little more controversial but it's one way at least if we can't reach uh, ben Ray himself. We need to reach his staff and get that message across through his staff. Mm -hmm. Were you here when he said the 300,000 petition signatures were delivered to Heinrich recently and no. ignored it? Mm -hmm. the, but it is, there's nothing wrong with those visits, and it, but we are, um, th that's a good idea, and we can. But they, they'll go a lot better if we've got a whole hell of a lot of people in one place. Um, because right now, yeah. we have made many visits to their offices, and they aren't listening. And um, they will talk to you politely, <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. That's as far as it goes. Um, <laughs> We have quite a few. We have quite a few videos of those visits. As a matter of fact, is there a possibility that we could be provided with a brief um, write-up to yep. send out as an email to friends and people to inform them, you know, without trying to explain in our own words, you know, exactly what it is we're trying to do, so that you know, as each of us can yes. generate 10 or 15 people to show up at this event, we certainly have to inform them. Yes, we'll do that. Okay. So the back, the best single background is this. Right. Um, we put a, another, a couple things on the back, Trish did. Um, these, these are talks, uh, that one of them was testimony in the legislature, and the other one is a more technical for uh, people in D.C. And this was a recent op-ed in the journal. And the presentations have the links. web link. So you can see the whole presentation at the web link. It's at the top of each one. Can't see, but, um, but, so this is good background, but we need to do another one for November 5th. Yeah, a bit more succinct and to the point because everybody's overwhelmed with emails and, and reading right. and I think right. we can right. We'll do it. You know, we'll do it. Okay, we hear you too about succinct. You and know, one thing that we're looking at here, we all look we all look at each other. We look at it. We come from a place where we've experienced and fought nuclear energy all of our lives at some level. Just everybody here. So we should be committed to bringing one young person. All of it. One this young man here, yes. thank you for coming, but everybody here should have uh, their nephew, because you know what kids do? They go back to the school bell the next day and say, you know, I went to this meeting last night, it's really interesting. And then they garner support. They don't like this. Right. But they don't have any power. Right. And bring your grandchildren, even yeah. twelve-year-olds, nine-year-olds. Mm -hmm. Get them because they have minds that are uh, <laughs> absorbing the climate change crisis, mm -hmm. and 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 I think that they can mm -hmm. they can latch on to this. Yes, yeah. that, groups that are already out there. That paints that paints that you just showed us. Great, great. That paints that you showed us. Yes, what? That page Next that you were just showing us with all your points and everything? Yes. Oh, this one here. Yeah. You know what? I have to get an actual hard copy of the Santa Fe Reporter to get that information. I could not, for the life of me, find that online. So, oh my goodness. Yeah. So, I mean, for, you're not getting your money's worth with the Santa Fe Reporter. If they're printing that, yes. they should also make that available on their website because it, I could not find it. I found it. I didn't find it. I looked. I looked and I couldn't find it on their website for the Santa Fe Reporter. Yes, ma'am. Today. 
Huh. Is it on the Today. Yeah. It is. It is. It's on our website. And um, then I've got copies printed out of there. Take, take however many you need. I, uh, there's your, uh, Utopia. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, oh, that's awful. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hold on. Yeah. Uh, this was a talk for, uh, young people. Yeah. Utopia. Oh, oh my no. God. That's yes, yes. 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 All right. I, I just want to say about the culture that we are headed toward and the signs. I want to just, uh, just take a minute to look at what's, going on here. Uh, this is a pier. Um, this brewery has a branch in Los Alamos. Um, the name means evil. And so, uh, the Booze Brothers. And this, of course, is in Texas. Um, and this is the other Texas product there, right in the foreground. Um, these, another brewery oh just started up. They, in Albuquerque, the bro, one of the breweries that's going to be sponsoring the, the event tomorrow. Yes. In Albuquerque. Yes. They, they did the exact same thing. If it's they're really pushing the whole veteran-owned business. Yes. And then they're, they're using all these nasty names for their beer. Uh, yes. Uh, and uh, <laughs> this is. Um, you know, how, this is the scene in D.C. with uh, Congressman uh, Grisham and uh, her cousin back there, our senator, um, getting shown the ropes um, by, I just love the body language. This woman here was, uh, is the current head of the NNSA. Oh, my God. Um, Jill Ruby. Uh, then, these are real uniform patches. Um, from uh, the nuclear weapons business, and the uh, so there's a kind of a death cult. Uh, this is the culture inside the nuclear weapons business. The culture. Oh, that's awful. This is not a joke. No, not no. A joke. these are real. No, no, these are real. No. This is real. Are you? This is not a joke. Are they retarded? No, that's awful. No, they're ordinary called dominionists who want the world to end. They do. Yeah. There's a. I heard a talk from a former Amish general who woman who uh, works in this business, and she was an amazing, weird, uh, being very chipper and all of this. This is in Albuquerque here. Um, this is a mural in, in Albuquerque, mm -hmm. underground. The Six Seal, Revelation six twelve. Um, and anyway, that was uh, that's it. I, want, I just wanted to. Oh yeah. my God! Now we, we have that is so mind blowing. Yeah. Okay. Did we actually wear that shirt. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, I just want to go back to this <laughs> yeah. whole thing of the meeting. We need to ask Chris. We need yeah. to do to delay. Yes. Delay. 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 <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. uh, November fifth. One person at a time. Yeah. Bring all our yes. Okay. So, where is that documented? How yes. can I get information about it? We can send that to you. Wait. Yeah. Trish, we uh, be sure we have your email and. Yes, there's a sign-up sheet over here for November 5th, but it, if you want to get on our email list, put your information on there. I'll, I'll add you to our email list, and if you have any questions for me, my business card and Greg's is over there, and our email address is on there. Email us a message, and we'll definitely answer you. So this falls, the name of this topic uh, is Innovation Villages. So the developer of... Uh, uh, um, was interested in building innovation villages, and his company is called uh, New Mexico Innovation Triangle. Uh, one in Los Alamos, one in Santa Fe, one in Albuquerque. That's right. Yeah. This petition-looking thing, is that what you're talking about? Uh, sign-up sheet? I don't know. No, that's a petition. What's this? That's the call so, for sanity. That, yeah. that the, is a different movement that we're also using. So we're going to... We're trying to get a lot of people signed on to that, but right now, yeah. the other sign-up sheet is for November 5th for the demonstration. So I I guess I want to kind of, this, this point that we're circling around here, how do we make some progress here? And the 
it, the common denominator of experience that's percolating from a number of people, we and we agree with it, is that the traditional ways of rationally talking to people and having a, a dialogue with the lawmaker and so forth, that's not going to do it. We, we don't have their attention. And I know you've all heard this. When I, w I was a young environmental activist, I was 21 years old in this town, and I worked for a man named Brant Calkin. And uh, I said to Brant, Oh, look, we could do this grant proposal, and we could bring these corporate heads, and we could take them to the wilderness, and they would be influenced by the beauty of the wilderness, and they would become environmentalists. <laughs> and he said to me, that uh, like the old prospector just said that his mule would always did everything he said he would do, but then he came to the creek and didn't cross the creek, and the guy with him said, "You said your your mule would do anything you said," and then he got a two by four and he hit the <laughs> mule on the head, and then he crossed the creek. And he said, "Yeah, I just didn't. I didn't have his attention." Mm. And I said it poorly, but that, that was the point that Graham was trying to get across to me, that you have to get people's attention before they will listen. And we do not have their attention. Yes, sir. We could hold our own press conference. Yes. Go live on Facebook, for instance. I don't know how close we can get to the labs without risking arrest. I mean, I would be willing to hold a press conference right up to the gates of, this la of the labs or whatever. Yes. Go live on Facebook and then yes. we march. Mm -hmm. I would be willing to walk the 72 miles, whatever it takes, <laughs> from the labs to the state capitol. And you know, I mean, do you see what I'm saying? And it brings yeah. press, it brings yeah. a little bit of media coverage. Yes. I don't know. Yeah, yes. right. But something crazy like that, because yes. it's, because yes. 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 I'm sorry, yes. but all the other traditional stuff, look exactly. at where we're at now. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. <laughs> We have to have on <laughs> um, So we don't envision November 5th as the end of the road, but the beginning. Yes. Yes. So we need yes. to build uh, strength. We need to get this stuff in the newspaper. And there is a censorship going on in the newspapers yes. about yes. all this. Oh, yeah. um, yes. there, there used to be a health, more healthy competition the, the reporter was a minor part of it, but was part of it. Uh, remember in the days when they really did investigative work, a lot of it. Um, then the New Mexican, and under different management, the, the Journal North had a lot more people and some very aggressive reporters. We had the Tribune, then we had the main Albuquerque Journal, who had also their own serious reporters. Now there's not one single reporter that has a solid beat of this, and so they can't understand it, and they're frightened to write about it, just from the technical or factual perspective. So we have to break through this kind of barrier and um, and connect with the other issues. Mm -hmm. I think that's to get out of this stovepipe that we've been divided into. Mm -hmm. um, in back in '71, all of the environmental and social issues were pretty much connected here in this town. So we had in our office one of the few Xerox machines in town. <laughs> and uh, it was, uh, up. so Brandt was uh, helping build the first uh, La, La Clinica because there wasn't a clinic for poor people, a health clinic. Well, that was part of the environmental spirit and it, at that time under, under Brandt. And, now we have all it's very, very separate. But we have got, we're at the top in, in mistreatment of our children, the bottom in our child well-being. And this is all related to the failure of our leadership here and giving up uh, our ambitions. And we need to have, we need to think about and demand a lot more from our leaders. Search life in Mexico, are they on this? Search life in Mexico. It's Wait. one of those online oh, media things. Oh, search life in Mexico. Yeah, yeah. Right, I was thinking of search life. No, no, no. The second thing is circulation paper is yeah. the paper in Albuquerque. Yes. 
Um, the paper. The, the, yeah. Yep. Maybe they'd be interested. They well, might well. Yeah. If they thought it yeah, was yeah, like, yes, I, I was briefly. Because <laughs> they are doing actually yes. not very well. Yes. 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 Let's make the conversation of the search line of Mexico. Yeah. 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 That's a good idea, and we need to follow up on the, the issue that it makes things more difficult. Okay, we are. We only have one next step. Okay, that's it. Which is November fifth. Okay. And everything. But you, but you that, have this whole thing about roles and volunteers. And oh yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I we just also wanted, need to get religious communities um, yeah. and. Um, yep. And um, indigenous communities involved. Yes. So, right. so all of these are of a piece, but I have to tell you. So, so I have to, you know, tell you how this works. Most of our institutions, most of our indigenous communities, are under somebody's thumb. Yeah. And they are not easy to bring along. So, searchlight depends on grants. Mm -hmm. um, most environmental organizations depend on grants. Environmental law places depend on grants. They come from Democratic Party oriented funders. The Democratic Party is the one that's pushing the pit production here. And so the, we are the designated place for pit production according to the most of the Democratic Party. In fact, all as far as I know. Are there some residents here? They probably support you. They, we, they are scarce. Yeah. So, so the, we have got to pull together enough visible support in order to move some of those folks. We need volunteers. We need especially volunteers in outreach. So that's Chico Bay's point. That, um, because it's very time consuming. Um, when you call somebody, to talk to them and organize them. It's a two-way street. They're organizing you too. And so uh, pretty soon you don't have any, you can't, uh, uh, you are, you're in a net of relationships which determine everything that you do. And if that net is, it can be very constrained. We can't do anything in Washington. So without, without volunteers that are reaching out for, uh, to help organize, it is very difficult to make happen. So how do we volunteer? Sign up, talk to Trish, take a business card, call us, write us. Okay. And then without even doing that, reach as many people as you can to come on November 5th and if you have any questions at all, or if you need any materials at all, like this uh, lady back here said, we should provide them. So ask for it. All right, I, I, Trish is on that paper. Okay, before you so leave, too, I would ask that you just say a big thanks to Greg and Trish because this is a two-person.